Father God, thank you so much for uh, bringing us together this evening. I'm praying, Lord, as we meet together, as we look into your word together, as we pray together, Lord, that you would just do a, a mighty work among us, God. Um, and I, I'm praying that you would help us to see you for who you truly are, not who we've made you to be, but who you've revealed yourself to be, Lord. So help us to recognize your presence with us in these moments. And uh, we pray for those who uh, aren't here tonight. Maybe they're, they're watching online with us, Lord. We pray that you would encourage them uh, in a great way this evening as well. So uh, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so I, w- I want to start out. We were going to sing. And I was like, no, I don't want. Uh, it's not that I don't want to sing. Uh, well, I... I forgot to sing. You kids, like on Wednesdays for the youth, we don't sing all the time. I don't think you all do either. So it's okay, but I still want to give you all an opportunity to praise. Uh, so Isaiah's got a microphone. And here's what I want you to do. Um, I know sometimes you take prayer requests and stuff like that, and uh, we, we'll definitely pray. But uh, I want to hear maybe from you guys something the Lord's doing in your life, something you just want to praise the Lord for that He's doing in your life, or maybe something that. He's teaching you through his word right now, so uh, I just want to kind of give you guys an opportunity before, we're going to be in Colossians 3, by the way, if you got your Bibles, we'll be in Colossians 3. Uh, I don't want you to think that I'm just like, hey, yeah, everybody give praise, because I ain't got nothing. No, I've got, I've got stuff, okay? I know that's what you're thinking, Terry, all right? <laughs> he didn't prepare nothing. <laughs> no, I promise, I, I'm, I'm prepared as I can be, right? Uh, but no, I just wanted to give you guys, because we... I, I, you know, we miss being able to do that on Sunday nights. We haven't got to do that in a long time. It's been a weird year. Um, so I just want to kind of hear from you guys and see what the Lord's teaching you, uh, what he's encouraging in, just things that you've been praying for that, he, that he's just came through in a mighty way for. So anything, he's got a mic, he'll come to you. Raise your hand. Anybody? Adam. Adam's got one. Go ahead, Adam. Number two, is it green? Keep pushing it. Now it's green. There it is. Okay. Um, I've, I've talked to some of you guys about it. Uh, some of you don't know, but four years ago, I was working at uh, Woodridge, and I was driving by a gas station, and they had one of those instant hiring things, and I pulled in, uh, and uh, I just decided, you know, I want to do that. Um and I got the job, loved it, and after a couple of weeks, I quit my job at the hospital. I was like, this is what I want to do. This is going to be my career. I thought at the time it would be about three months until I was in a management position, mm. and uh, God had other plans. Um, I had some things I needed to learn, some maturing I needed to do. Uh, and through two companies and um, lots and lots of, of learning, and it's got to be upwards of 30 different stores I've transferred to now. Um, I, this past Wednesday was uh, promoted to a full-time management position uh, permanently. Right on. Um, and uh, the woman who promoted me was the same one who said, uh, you're never going to make it. You, uh, you <laughs> <laughs> you Eat can't, coal, woman. You, you yeah. can't do that. <laughs> um, and that, uh, you know, uh, it's been good. Um, you know, like I said, uh, we've been studying in Psalms. Mm. Um, went over my favorite verse last last Wednesday night. Um, the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Mm. Um, God teaches us things, and sometimes it's not pleasant. Um, but he has a purpose, and his purpose in this was not for me to get a management position. It was for me to understand more about who he is. Mm, good word. And so I just want to uh, praise him for that. Amen. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Praise the Lord, man. That's awesome. Thanks, <laughs> I think that um, after eight years of, after a church split that we were involved in, highly involved in the church in all different capacities, 
we kind of floated for eight years. And mm. honestly, when we left that church, I said I would never, ever, ever go back to a Baptist church again. Mm. And you know what that means. <laughs> 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 but I, I cannot tell you how at peace and how much um, I just feel like I'm at home now mm. at this church. It's been a long haul. A lot of, like Adam said, I can reiterate, you know, what he said is just been a lot of growing and peeing off, peeling off layers mm. of um, unforgiveness and anger and frustration and finding love where all of that used to be. And just really hearing what God has for us to do outside of our own ability to figure it out ourselves. Mm. You know, he gives us intelligence and motivate, you know, we're supposed to be motivated and pursue things. But um, he has had us in a holding pattern for about 11 months now. And it's just been, it's exciting to be a part of a church and to see how the process has worked in our lives. Mm. And we're just real grateful to be at Mount Zion. The Baptist Church. The Baptist Church. That I said I would never go back to. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> and we're glad to have you guys too. Uh, praise the Lord for that. He, he has a way of like humbling us and showing us that he's king and not a consultant, you know. So Dave's got one. It's actually a couple of different things. One, I, I'll start off with uh, we had been praying about this. Angel had a nice trip to her grandchildren, so she got back late last night, so that all went well. But then mainly what I was going to tell you is, and it was a very big surprise to me, uh, but my son actually sent me a text message with a picture. My oldest grandson was baptized. Grandfather and grandson, in short order. Wow. The week after you, or a couple weeks after, that's awesome. Praise the Lord, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, brother. Sometimes there's no words, man. That's that's great. Praise the Lord. So you said your, that was your oldest or youngest? Oldest. My oldest grandson. That's awesome. Where they live at? Uh, Arkansas. Okay. Rick, okay. I act like, like I know where that's at, but <laughs> I I don't. <laughs> okay. I'm going back to my geography class in high school now. Like, oh, okay, that's uh, that's awesome. Praise the Lord, man. Very good. Who else? How about you, Isaiah. You got you got a mic in your hand. Come on, preach a little, brother. <laughs> How's Greek going? Good. Yeah, he's he's in his first semester of Greek at Graham right now. Uh, so he doesn't have many words to say right now, right, brother? <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, before we get to Colossians, I, I'll share something that I shared with our men's group the other day that was really, uh, it was kind of, it was really cool to see in Scripture. Uh, we were talking about how God kind of brings us down to our lowest points many times purposefully, uh, because we are talking about the uh, we were actually in 2 Corinthians, we were talking about when Paul said that he was, uh, he was at the point of just despairing of life uh, because of this certain situation that he was in. And that morning I'd been uh, reading through Genesis and um, uh, the past, past couple of weeks I've been going through the story of Joseph on Tuesday mornings because that's how my Bible study works out. Is I'm, I mean, well, I won't go into that. Anyways, I was, I was there, all right? I've been talking, I've been listening, looking at Joseph and you know, I saw this pattern that kind of um, really encouraged me in Scripture when it comes to God's pattern of anointing for His people. Uh, and the pattern, it, it looks like a U, okay? So it starts out with, if you remember when jo Joseph, he was 17 years old. You remember this? Uh, he was 17 years old, and God gives him a dream. He gives him a vision uh, of what was going to happen with him. Anybody remember what it was? Thank you, Lori. Good job. I don't know if that was a, a cat meow or bow. Okay, cat meow or bow. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So, yeah, uh, that everybody was like his brother his and even his mother and father all were going to be bowing down to him, right? He had this vision, and I'm sure as a 17-year-old kid, he was very humble about it, right? 
<laughs> You're going to bow. <laughs> now, I'm sure, I'm sure he wasn't humble about it, but God gave him this vision, uh, this anointing, really, this, this calling on his life. Uh, but then, of course, you know what happens is that he, he gains this, so he has this anointing by God, but then automatically there's this jealousy of man, right? His brothers are like, what? I ain't bowing down to you. And their jealousy makes them reject him. Remember this? They reject him, and what do they do with him? They wanted to kill him, right? That's what, that was their intention, but they just throw him down into a pit. And I don't know what they were expecting to do after that. They're just like, ah, you're in a pit now. You know, we ain't bowing down to you. You're below us. I don't know what their plan was after that, but these raiders come through, and they're like, hey, uh, yeah, why don't we sell him? So they sell him, and remember, he gets, at this point, he goes down into, he's in the pit, and he doesn't come up into a better spot, into a better circumstance necessarily. He becomes a slave. And, but then God kind of exalts him in that. But then as soon as everything's going great as this slave in Potiphar's house, remember Potiphar's wife was like, hey, young man, you're looking good. Come over here. And he says, no, I can't do that. And uh, she says, well, I'm, I'm going to go after you anyways. And he runs. She cries, oh, he tried to, he tried to rape me, right? That's what she's yelling out. And uh, at that point, what's Potiphar do? Throws him in prison. You're not just this hired slave anymore, you're in prison and he's there. And if you remember, uh, if you kind of do your math a little bit, from the time he is, he gets this calling, he gets this anointing to the time that he's here in the, in the prison pit, it was, it was 13 years. Now that's a long time. You're talking about eight years, you're talking about, what, five years. And there's this, but there's this, down at the very bottom here is this pit. It's, in other places, it looks like a wilderness. It looks like uh, God promised this and he called me to this, but I'm nowhere near that. I'm down here. But then what's God do with him? God delivers him out of the pit and exalts him to the place of the right hand of Pharaoh. And eventually, remember, all his brothers and, and his father and everybody would be bowing down to him. But it wasn't, at that point for him, it wasn't like, ha, ha, ha. It was, he recognized that God had sent him ahead to deliver them. Now, this is a pattern that you see in Scripture that happens uh, like with David and his anointing. Remember, David is, uh, it, he was a young kid as well. Uh, we don't really know the age of him at this point, but he was anointed as king, and he went right to the palace, right? Not really. He kind of did, but he wasn't king. He was, he was a servant to Saul, and his anointing, his calling made Somebody else jealous. Remember this pattern? Who was it? It was Saul. He made Saul was jealous of David because everybody starts crying out like, oh, you know, Saul is uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. And and he hears that and he becomes so jealous that he rejects David, right? Pattern keeps going down. And then where does David end up whenever whenever Saul is trying to kill him and get rid of him? Where does he end up at? Do you remember? In a cave, literally in the wilderness. Like the last couple chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, see, you see him in the wilderness. It's nowhere near the palace. It's, it's in a cave. It's in the wilderness. He's nowhere near where God had called him that he was going to be. But then what's he do? He delivers him out, and he exalts him to the place of king. Correct? Think of another example. How about Jesus? Right? Jesus is already the anointed. He is the coming Messiah. That's who he is. But then as he comes, what happens? The jealousy of the Jews, they reject him. He ends up in the ultimate pit, the grave, death. Right? But then what's God do? He delivers him out of it by the same spirit. And he, he exalts him where? To the right hand of God. Do you see that pattern? This pit, this wilderness, those eight years, those five years, those 13 years is necessary. God uses the wilderness to humble us. He uses the pit to humble us to where we can all, we're not looking at ourselves or anything like that. We are looking up to him. That is what we do. That's how he does that. That's his process of humbling. So don't despise it when you're in that place. And by the way, this is also what he does with his church as a whole right now. Because the anointing, the calling that he has on his church right now is to do what? It's to rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever, this kingdom. Now, does it feel right now that you are ruling and reigning over this earth? Does it feel like it? No. In fact, we are called out in the New Testament. We're, 
we're called exiles. And it's this picture of, again, we're in the wilderness. There's the calling, but we are rejected and jealous by man and rejected by man. And we are in this place of often despair, often trial, often temptation. And it doesn't feel like the place that we were called to, but he is taking us there. This time now is necessary. But that, call, that where you're going to be at is not going to be on this present earth. And I think that's where a lot of our problems come in because we think that God's calling, God's anointing and all those things. We think that, it, oh yeah, it's going to be completely fulfilled right now, but it never is until we are ultimately with him. That's where we're ultimately headed as the church. So the wilderness is necessary. So I just wanted you to see that pattern that God gives to humble his people. You see that? has nothing to do with Colossians, but I hope you're there now. So that was, that was free. There you go. So... Um, Colossians chapter 3, I've been going through the book of Colossians with the students on Wednesday nights, and uh, I just want to continue with it, and uh, some of this might be a review for them, um, but newish for you guys, so um, we're going to read verses 1 through 17 together, and then we're going to pray. So Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must, not not you, you could or you should, but you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice. Slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Lord, we thank you for this, for this word that you've given us to read and to study and to, to ponder this evening. I pray, Lord, that you would give us Uh, understanding and insight into it. Holy Spirit, that you would lead this time, that you would open our our minds and our hearts to receive the things that we need as individuals, but also as, as as a family, as your church, Lord. So I pray that you teach us, guide us into your truth in these moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So there are four commands given within that passage that we just read. Four commands. I'm only going to talk about one of them, but I'm going to give you the other ones just in case. Uh, The other three I've already went through with the students, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through this. But these these are four commands for the resurrected life. 
for the resurrected life, for, the, for those who are in Christ, because the very first thing he says in verse 1 is he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. That's where we start. This is talking about the resurrected life, what it looks like to live in Christ, to live as a Christian. If that's who you are, if you've been raised with Christ, then this is what's going to follow. These commands, they're not, they're not like, hey, this would be nice for you to do as a Christian. They are commands. But again, these are not commands that are given in order for us to, to receive righteousness or to receive grace. It's a response to the grace that we already have received because we've already been raised with him. Do you get that? So don't, don't look at these and be like, okay, if I'm kind and compassionate, then, I'm, then that makes me saved. No, Jesus makes you saved. Jesus makes you righteous. It's not your works that makes you righteous. It's his works that make you righteous. And because you're already placed in him in that way, if you're already, you're already raised with him, right? That's that picture of baptism that I love seeing. And I've been, I've been jazzed about all the, the baptisms we've had lately. Brock took me down the other night, by the way, uh, or the other morning. He's a lot bigger than I am. Um, and I'm glad I did it at the end because I got soaked as well. But it was awesome. We were both just like, ah, you know. It was great. Because what? Because of the picture that this gives, that you have been buried in the grave with Christ. That means that you are now dead to sin. Dead to sin. Not dead in sin anymore, but dead to it. You have been buried. That was the funeral of the old self. You've been raised now a new creation in Christ. The old's passed away. Behold, he's making all things new now in your life. And that's the resurrected life. Like your life as a Christian, your life as living righteous is not just ahead of you. It's now. He's doing it now in your life. And sometimes as Christians, we, we don't really live that way. We still live like we're, we're still dead in our sins. And we give ourselves the excuses, oh, I'm just an old sinner, saved by grace. And that's a great saying, but it, it kind of downplays what Christ has done in you. Because it makes you feel like I'm justified to stay there because I'm still in the flesh. No, no, you are a new creation, a new spirit, a new heart. He wasn't lying when he said that. That's why he gives these commands. And this is not legalism. This is not self-righteousness. This is just Bible. This is what he says. If you've been raised with Christ, there's four big commands that he gives us. First thing he says is to seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. That's the first command that he gives. This idea of seeking. Now, when you think of, like, I'm seeking after something, I'm going after something, that has to do with your desires, with your affections, with your pursuits in life. Now, that's a big question to ask, is what are you personally seeking in your life? Are, are you seeking, you know, health, wealth, happiness? Is that what, is that, but by the way, um, you can often know what you are seeking by looking at your prayers. What, what is it that you pray for? James has been messing me up, not that James, but you could mess me up. Uh, the book of James, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> the book of James, chapter, especially uh, around chapter four is where I've been out here lately um, on another day of the week and. He's talking about, like, what, what is it that, that causes these quarrels and fights and arguments among you? He said, isn't it, it's this, that your passions are at war with one another. You, you covet, but you, you don't receive, so you murder, and you do all these things. And he says, yet you don't have because you don't ask. But if, even when you do ask, he says, you don't receive because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly to spend it on your own pleasures. What's he talking about there? He's talking about prayer, Right? But then 1 John talks about the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to this will, his will, it will be done. Now, that's a promise I don't think we bank on enough. If we ask anything according to his will, it, he will do it. And you're like, well, his will is kind of a mystery, isn't it? Like, if it happens, I guess that was his will. If it doesn't happen, I guess that wasn't. That's not what he's talking about with his will. His will has been clearly expressed here in Scripture. You know what it is? You know what God's will for your life is? Your sanctification. That you would be holy as he is holy. That you'd be thankful and rejoicing and praying always. That's scripture. That you would die to self. Right? That here, here's, here's a few other things that are clearly his will because he's commanded us to do it. That you would die to self. 
that you would glorify God, that you would edify the church, that you would take care of the widows and the orphans. That's God's will. How do I know that? Because he, he said that. He's commanded that. If he commands us to do it, then don't you think it's his will? His, that if we pray according to those things, he's absolutely and in every way going to do it. Me and Brandy had that conversation a while back about, because um, like the, 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 uh, the truck in Kenya just miraculously, very quickly got paid for. 25 grand came in like 30 minutes. Now, we've been praying to that end for sure, but like, how do we know that that was God's will? Was it that just that it came through? No, it was that God's will is for us to take care of the oppressed, is to take care of the poor. So if we're doing that, if we're this, it doesn't help us any by giving somebody else $25,000, right? It would have been a lot better for us to, in, in the world's minds or whatever else, to say, well, why don't we just put that on ourselves? Or why can't we just raise that for ourselves? Because God's will is never for us to build up ourselves. It's always to build up others. So whenever we pray and work according to that end don't you think he's gonna do it yeah for sure and that, that that jacks me up you know because it makes me like man I I'm gonna keep praying according to his will according to what he clearly says now this all has to do with your pursuits and you're wondering like why is it that I'm praying for this and for this and for this and God says no well usually it's because it's because maybe it's not maybe it's not his timing but also maybe it really is not according to his will but it's according to your pleasures and your desires your pleasures, your desires always lead you to self-exaltation, self-gratification, and that's completely the opposite of what Christ has taught us to do. It's never to self-exalt, to self-promote, to self-gratify. It's always to lift him up high. It's always to encourage others. It's always to build up others. And you're miserable in your life because you're trying to make yourself happy by doing all these things for yourself. And you're miserable. Why? Because you're seeking the things that aren't above. You're seeking the things that are here. And you're miserable. You wonder why? Because you're trying... See, self-exaltation, sin, always promises pleasure. It always promises rest. But it always makes life chaotic. It always brings you to despair. It always causes tension within your family. See what I'm saying? But if you've been raised with Christ, that old way of thinking is to die. You're to put that to death. He says, seek the things that are above where Christ is. That he would be your true affection. He would be your true desire. He would be your true pursuit. The second command, I'm going way longer with this than I, what I planned, but that's okay. Just follow me. The second command he gives is to set your minds on things that are above. Now, we, uh, whenever somebody says, hey, just... If, if somebody's saying, oh, I just can't do this. I can't, just can't do this. Maybe you as parents are dealing with that right now with, you know, having to school your kids. Uh, and uh, they're, they're saying, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. And you say, like, hey, just think about it. Just, hey, just set your mind to it. Thank you, Jamie. Just set your mind to it. This has to do with, like, again, this has to do with putting your attention on something. But even further than that, if you... You ever heard the phrase, I'm sure you have, hey, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything. What's the anything that people are usually referring to in that sense? Usually it's something in regards to your purpose. Hey, Isaiah, you want to play for the Atlanta Braves? Just put your mind to it. <laughs> you're, you're too old now, aren't you? Yeah. Huh? You're just not good enough. <laughs> now just put your mind to it. It's like, well, that's... It's not enough, right? No, uh, but it, usually when somebody says, hey, just put your mind to it, you can do anything. It has to do with what that person feels like their purpose is. So whenever we're talking about setting your minds on something, we're talking about attention and purpose. And so many of us, we feel like that our purpose is something that's, again, within this world. You know, what's my destiny? What's my purpose? Again, it's found in Christ because your identity and when you think about identity, it comes down to this idea of uh, who you are and what do you do. Anybody ever ask you that? Yeah? Hey, hey Daryl, who, who are you? What do you do? People are always interested in what you do. You know, you sit on a, you get on an airplane beside somebody, uh, and, and they, that's always the opening question to this stranger that you're going to sit beside for eight hours. It's like, oh, so what do you do? What am I really asking? I'm asking, who are you? 
What is your identity? What is your purpose in life? Right? And how you answer that question shows what, what you want people to think about yourself. Well, huh, you know, I, I'm a manager, or I'm a, I'm a pastor, or I'm a this. Nobody ever comes out and says something like, yeah, I, uh, I'm like the assistant janitor at McDonald's. You know, they'll say like, oh, I'm, I'm working through my career process or something like that. They're not, they don't want to be identified as like, this is my life, right? But so often we try, to, we try to say the best thing about us or what we used to be, right? What we've done. Oh, I was this. You know, I did this. And it's this idea, we want people to think the very best of us. We, we're, ex again, trying to exalt ourselves in other people's eyes. But your identity is not in what you do on this earth. Your identity is not in what you have done on this earth or what you plan to do on this earth. Your identity is set and found and firm in the person that owns this earth. It is found in Christ. That is where your true identity is. And if you can get to that point and just recognize that I am an ambassador I am a child of the king, then it won't matter what you do on this earth. You won't be dissatisfied by being the assistant janitor at McDonald's. Nothing wrong with that. Somebody's got to clean toilets, right? Or be the backup to the person that cleans toilets, because if you're at McDonald's, you'll probably get sick from cleaning toilets, I'm sure, so they need a backup. I went through a long process there. But anyways, you know what I'm saying here in the sense of setting your minds on things that are above. That's where Christ is, not on things of the earth. Your purpose, your identity is found in him, not things here. So seek and set. The third command he gives is to put to death or put off. And it's this, it's really a picture of clothing here that he's going to give, of like putting off something. It's like putting off the, these filthy rags and putting on something else. That's going to be the fourth command. But it, what he tells you to do is put to death, put off what's earthly within you. And he, he mentions those things. Uh, the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And I'll, let me say one quick word on that one because the other ones speak for itself. But I always like pointing this out when Paul says covetousness, which is idolatry. The question is, we, we read through that and we're like, yeah, yeah, of course, covetousness is idolatry because Paul says so. But if you're stopped and ask yourself, why does he say that's idolatry? Coveting? Desiring something that's not yours? Why is that? Idol? Like, who's the idol in that situation? You ever thought about that? You students should know, but you won't answer. Ah, you know it. Well, who is it? You got it. Go ahead. Huh, somebody else said it. What? You, somebody beat you. Who said it? Did you say it? Self. The idol in covetousness is self. The I, when you covet, when you desire, when you, I, I should have that. Who's the God in your life at that point? You. That's why he calls it idolatry. That's the greatest idol. In fact, every other uh, religion uh, throughout the existence of the known world, every religion... Every, every religion except for Christianity, the idol might be somebody else. It might be Baal or whoever else, but it's, Baal's not really the object of their affection. They are. It's what Baal can do for me. It's not what I can do for Baal. It's what Baal can do for me. The true God in any other religious context is self. Does that make sense? And that's the same thing in coveting. When you're when you're just totally displeased with where you are as a human being, when you're totally discontent with what you do and what you have, and say, I deserve more, I should be more, you're really thinking a lot of you, aren't you? When you're pursuing things for you, I've got, I just got to make myself happy. That is the most idolatrous statement that so often gets spewed throughout so many Christians this day. I just... I think God wants me to be happy. I should be happy. Really, you're, you're worshiping self and you're wanting God to come along and bow down to you and your desires and your will. See what I'm saying? God Is God after your joy? Yes. But your, what you perceive as happiness and what he knows to be true joy are completely at odds with one another. That's why you look to him and not what you think is going to please you. 
Because every time somebody says, I, I just think God would want me to be happy, usually it's in the context of like divorce, you know, or I'm tired of all these kids, you know, so I'm, I'm out, right? <laughs> Jamie, don't laugh. She's beside of you, okay? <laughs> the right side of <laughs> Now, that's, I know you're going to hug now, aren't you? Reagan, I love you. <laughs> I love you guys. Um, but this idea of putting off that covetousness attitude, that idolatrous attitude, you put that off because your identity, again, is no longer in what you've done or what you're doing or what you're going to do, but your identity is in Christ follow now that's especially important for you young people uh and you young youth pastor man like your identity is not in being like yeah i'm, I'm gonna be a pastor you already are a servant of god so just be it you know don't don't wait to be what god's called you to be. do it he's called you to be his ambassador do it don't wait you're not promised tomorrow do it because your identity is already in him you're an ambassador you're a child of the king I want to get to this. Um, this is my whole intention, and I'm going to get there. He says to put on, verse 12. I'm sorry, I want to go to verse 9. Verse 9. He says, don't lie to another. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off. Again, this idea is like you've already done this. Because you were, whenever you were put into those waters, it wasn't just a, a next step. This was, again, the, uh, this was the funeral of the old self and the marriage ceremony of the new self to Christ. That's what that is whenever we see that. So you've got a brand new identity. You're no longer, it's kind of like at a, at a wedding, you know, um, how, most of the time I do this, if I'm marrying somebody off, whenever I say, I now, after they kiss and all that stuff, and I say, I now introduce to you Mr. and Mrs., what do I add after that? Lily, do you remember? You were too excited. You try. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and she rubs his shoulder, yeah. Uh, I, I think I said this, I intended to, and obviously you don't, you try to forget this, but uh, whenever you, after you kissed, now I pronounce you husband and wife, you know, now kiss the bride, and then you turn around to go out, and I say, I now introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. Zach Moreland. Now, for you ladies, that's a very humbling thing, isn't it? Did you ever think about it? <laughs> yeah, I heard it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, the, thing, the reason it's so humbling is because you've now taken on his identity. Like, you, you sign Mrs. Daryl. Maybe you don't sign that, but like, you know. <laughs> but that's, everything that's in his name is, is yours now, though. That's the positive aspect of this. But you know, whenever you do this, you're baptized into his name. Does that make sense? Because we're the bride of Christ. We're baptized, we're no, I'm no longer known by Cody. That's why he says, I'll give you a new name that only I know. That's really intimate. That's really special that he says that to each individual person in that sense. But see what the deal is? It's a very humbling thing because now you're called a Christian. You're in Christ. You identify with his name. It's no longer your name. You're identifying with him. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a humbling thing because you're no longer yourself. You were bought with a price. But it's also a very whoa, joyous thing. Why? Because he owns all things. He has all things. He is king, sovereign, ruler over all things things everything that his is now is yours you're seated with him now that's a pretty privileged spot so i can take the humbling aspect of like now i'm in his name and not not mine no longer right so he says seeing as you've put off the old self with its practices and you've put on the new self and here's what he means by new self whenever we hear that phrase first of all it means that uh, this it's the self that's been raised with christ raised to walk in newness of christ that's the first aspect of this new self the second part is where he says here that it's being renewed in knowledge of Christ. It's being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And I love this because this knowledge is not merely informative, but it's intimate. When we talk about being renewed, this is an ongoing process. Now, as an actual person, as an actual human being, you're not constantly being renewed, are you? You get old, right? 
you get, you get wrinkly. You get closer to the earth, gravity-wise, right? Skin sags and all that stuff. It's no fun, right? You don't feel like you're being renewed. <laughs> you're on it, sister. I love it. <laughs> No, you, you, you feel the aches and the pains and, oh, man, and then weird hairs coming out of your ear that nobody tells you about, you know, stuff like that. That happens to me, if you're wondering. Uh, if I have one, just tell me. I'll pluck it. I promise, okay? My wife has three kids. She can't see it no more. She's always looking down, so help, help a brother out, you know? But you don't, as a human being, you're not, you don't feel like you're being renewed. You, you feel like you're being taken away from constantly but the the new self is being renewed it's getting better it's not dying it's coming more and more and more alive in the knowledge of christ and that knowledge again it's not it's not merely informative knowing things about him but it's knowing him it's intimacy with him communion and fellowship with christ that's how you're being renewed and this communion and fellowship that we have with him it transforms us makes us more like him because we become what we behold you ever notice how you might act different around different crowds you know it's kind of that same idea you are influenced by the ones that you're around the most so if i'm if i'm wanting to be influenced anywhere it's going to be i want to be more holy i want to be more like him so where should i be i should be more around him and people that are following him and are intimate with him, right? I shouldn't, I shouldn't be intimate with people that are not of him. I should be telling them about Christ, pointing them to Christ. But I, it doesn't mean that I should be around them and be influenced by them. Be around Christ, you become like Christ. The new self, again, it does not decay, it does not grow old. But there's this constant renewal that is happening in him. And in this, this is a really cool phrase because he says, all right, again, you're, you've, the new self, it's been raised with Christ, it's being renewed in the knowledge of Christ, but it's also meant to reflect the image of Christ. That's a really cool phrase where he puts here. He says, How, uh, you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That language right there, after the image of its creator, where should that point you back to? Have you ever heard that sort of talking before? Maybe in... What was the first book of the Bible? Was it Genesis? Was it Gen what? Somebody. Genesis, right? Man, it's okay. Uh, we were created in his image. Remember that? Genesis 1, 26, 28. He made man in his image. What does that mean? It means that man was meant to reflect him. His attributes and his actions. His they were meant to, to, to love and to have joy and be creative. Do the things that he does. Right? Reflecting him in attitude and action, attribute and action. That's what we were meant to do. But what happened? Genesis 3 happened. And that image is now tarred, right? It's a dim reflection. We see it sometimes, even still to this day, when people cry out for certain things in their life, like love. Why does everybody want love? Because they were created in his image and he is love right? Now they look for it in all the tarred and tarnished places, but they still, that's that deep desire that their creator has put into them, whether it's love or joy or justice even, or creativity. All those things, even if they don't honor him as God, those are reflections, tarred as they are, of their creator. But now, he says, this new creation has happened. You're the new creation. It's kind of cool when you think about it because uh, in, the, in the scheme of things, when God, when God created the earth, uh, you know, you had, the, you know had space being made, you had the birds and the bees and the fishes and the seas, and you had this order of things that happened. Who was the la what was the last thing to be created? Man, right? On God's good earth that he was creating, the last thing he made, the, the crowning jewel of his creation was man. What's he doing now? He's reversing the curse that man put upon the whole earth. And what was the first thing he starts recreating? Man. We're the first in the process. And it's going to continue on to where everything is renewed. You see that? Now here he says we're being renewed 
in knowledge after the image of its creator, we now, because we have this new nature, we are made now to where we can reflect him rightly because we're, we're raised with him, we're indwelt by him, by the Holy Spirit. He empowers us now to reflect his image as we were originally intended to. Does that make sense? That's a, I just I love that, seeing that, because sometimes we just shoo, go right over these things, but I just didn't want you to. So it's, it's the self that's made to reflect his image. And then fourthly, I want you to see this again in verse 11. He says here, talking about the the, being renewed in, in the knowledge and reflecting his character and reflecting his, our creator. He says, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. And this means that this new self is the self that's not defined. And I'm going to list a couple things here from here. The new self, again, sometimes we identify ourselves with what we think our greatest purpose is or what, what we like the most. Right or what we're the most interested in, or our heritage, where we came from. I'm a southerner. I'm a northerner. I guess I don't. John, I, I'm a New Yorker. I can't even say it. Uh, <laughs> you got one fan, John. Yeah, I guess you're not completely alone in this world. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I love you, buddy. He's awesome. He's a southerner now. Like you're, you know. But that doesn't matter, does it? Because your identity is not as a New Yorker. It's not as a Janice Lillian, you know. It's in Christ. And here's the deal. Your, your identity, the new self, is no longer defined. Here's the list. It's no longer defined by race or ethnicity. I, where do you see that? He says there's not Greek and Jew here. I love this because the difference of privilege, even when you think about it, the difference of privilege between those born of the natural seed of Abraham and those who were not, that privilege is now abolished through Christ. Sometimes we live as second-class citizens thinking that like we're not really God's chosen people, that Israel is cho- the chosen people, and Israel is chosen people, but you're a part of that. You might miss that sometimes, but if you want proof of that, I'm, I'm just going to turn over uh, two books over here to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. I'm just going to read this for what it says. This is an amazing thing that I don't want you to miss because it shows a great place of privilege for you, of what you've been brought into. The church is not, is not something distinct or different. It's a fulfillment. It's a bringing in of Israel. Now, look at this. I just want you to hear what Paul says on it. He's speaking here to these Greeks, to these Gentiles, the people that were not born of Israel. He says, remember this. At one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember this. At that time, and or at one time, and I want you to circle that, because here in a second, he's going to say, but now. But he says, at that time, verse 12, At that time, you were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, the state of Israel, the people of God. You You weren't part of this. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and you were strangers. You had no part to the covenants of promise. All the things that he promised Israel, you had no part in that. He says, remember that. Having no hope, you had no hope, and you were without God in the world. Circle this, but now in Christ. That's who you were, Greek man, Gentile man, barbarian man. That's who you were. You were outside of it. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, having nothing to do with that, you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace who's made us, being Jew and Gentile, he's made us both one, not two, one. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might do what? Create. There's a new creation that he's starting. That he might create in himself how many people? One new man 
in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and to those who were near. Again, talking Jew and Gentile. For through him we, have, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens like you once were. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. That saints term is an Old Testament term for Israel. He says you are fellow saints, fellow citizens with the saints and members of his household, the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and, and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You are now the temple of the Lord. In him also you're being built together in a, to a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I wanted you to see that, to recognize that you're no longer defined by whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're no longer uh, identified by, by race or ethnicity even in that sense, which is so often what we think about, and that's a problem that's going on in our country right now that I won't, I won't go too far into, but your identity first and foremost is not that you are white or that you are black or that you are Hispanic or that you are Asian or Caucasian or, uh, you know, some people like saying that, hey, I'm Irish. I'm like, you ain't never been to Ireland, man, right? Like, they love saying that and where they came from because they feel like their heritage is their identity. But no, it's not. Your identity is in Christ. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't do away with the differences. There's differences, but the differences, here's the deal. The differences that we have make us different, but they don't define us. Therefore, it shouldn't divide us. Our differences as Christians, it does not define us. Therefore, it should not divide us. So, you're no longer defined by race, ethnicity, or religious affiliation of a former pursuit. It's no longer that, yeah, I, was, I am a Muslim, or yeah, I am this, or I am that. That's not who you are anymore. Who you used to be does not matter now because that person's dead, and you've been raised to walk in newness of life. You're a new person, new creation in Christ. You're not defined by your nationality. Now, this is, a, this is a sore spot for some people because uh, America, I love living in America, and I'm, I'm proud to be an American. And I, I'll break into Lee Greenwood right now, but I won't, right? I, I won't. But my identity, my truest identity, is not a citizen of these United States. That's secondary, tertiary, maybe even. My true identity is a citizen of the kingdom of God. I just happen to live here, and I'm an ambassador here. And I'll pray for here, just like I'll pray for Kenya and Tanzania and England or wherever else. Because this is not really our home. We aren't home. The more you try to make this your home, the more miserable you're going to be. Because you're going to keep seeing the chaos, that we, like what we see happening even this day. Right? It's always going to be chaotic here. So why, why, why in the world would you try to build a house on a battlefield? That's where we are. Why would you set up a pool in the wilderness? Right? That's where we are. Why would you put decorations in the pit? That's, this ain't our home. Recognize that. Realize that in your life. That that's not our identity. It's not defined by nationality. It's not defined on whether I'm middle class or upper class or lower class or no class. It doesn't matter socioeconomic status. That does not define you. But you're defined by the person and work of Christ. And here's what he says. I'll end with this because I didn't even get to where we're to put on some things. Um, I'll let you do that in your personal study. How about that? But he says, put on then. Here's your identity. God's chosen ones. God's holy ones. God's beloved ones. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. That's, I was talking with a, a guy last night. Um, I got to preach over at the BCM. And man, those kids are like hungry for the word of God. And it's, it was, we were outside, but there's like 200 kids there. Right? And uh, anyways, I, I preached on uh, just how to deal with guilt and shame in a biblical way. And 
Um, I just reiterated over and over again the mercy of God that overcomes our sins of, of our past and our present and our future. And um, this one kid I was talking to afterwards, he's like, you know, sometimes I just get really angry at the goodness of God because I just, just give me what I deserve. You, you just keep being graceful. And like it doesn't make, and it just did not make sense to him in that sense. But he's chosen, you're chosen, not based upon your goodness, not based upon your worthiness. Not based upon what you do, but you're chosen based solely upon the grace of God. That's it. It wasn't because you were going to be an American, or you were going to be a Jew, or you were going to be this, or you were going to be that. that was not, that's, not, that's not the motivation behind his choosing. It's by grace, period. And it's always the most undeserving. But he calls you chosen. You realize he sought you out? And he's seeking you out, chosen, that the God of the universe, the perfect, the holy one, say, I, I want Zach. You know, I want, I want Adam. I'm pers- he desires you, that you're chosen, and that he calls you holy. Noble, you holy. You feel holy most of the time, noble. I think you're a pretty holy guy, but like, you don't think that, I know you don't think of yourself, that's why I asked you that. But he calls you holy, set apart unto him, righteous in him. He calls you holy and ah, beloved. When you feel so rejected by, the, by man, jealous of man, all those different things, you're rejected and hated and you feel like you never measure up and all those things, but you are beloved by the only one who really matters. That's your identity. Therefore, he's going to tell you to put on a couple things, which I don't have time to get into right now. So I want you as individuals, since I didn't finish, you finish it, okay? I want you to finish these verses tonight and, and with this context of realizing who you are, who this new self is, and why then he empowers you and calls you and commands you to put on these things. So will you do that for me? You can, you can do this or you can do this. Yes, thank you. I want you to do this. And what I want you to do in your time denied or time first thing in the morning is I want you to read through this. I want you to list out all the things that he tells you to put on. And ask yourself this question, what is my motivation to do that? And you'll be, I I hope you start doing some self-reflection on this and like, okay, I'm to put on compassionate hearts. Why? Because you've been shown compassion. I'll give you the first answer, right? But I want you to do that. Ask yourself, uh, what does he command us to put on and why? What's our motivation to do it? You got that? It's on video, so I'm, I'll send it to every one of you. Make sure you do it, okay? Uh, no, I, I thank you guys so much for being here tonight. And I pray that uh, as, we, as you go through this, that you would be indeed renewed in knowledge of your creator, that you'd be transformed to look like him in every way. So, Lord, we, uh, we praise you for the time that we have had together tonight. Thank you for every person, every student, every child, every adult that's here, and every one of them that's listening online also. And asking you, Lord, um, to, you know, just because we didn't finish, help us not to just say, we're, well, we're done. But let us look in. I pray that you would call it to our attention tonight and tomorrow morning uh, to look in these verses one more time and, and do some self-examination and that we would really look into your holy word and be transformed by it. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work that I, I can't do and that we can't do for ourselves, and that is to transform us. We can't do it ourselves. We are dependent and desperate upon you. So I pray that you would move and work in a great way among us these next few days. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Love you guys.